Hello and welcome to the Undead Gaming News Podcast, your one-stop shop for all things gaming. I'm your host, Zombie, and joining me is my co-host, Litchie. Hello! Starting off this week, we've got a new system software update for the PS4. This is version 9.00, and the patch notes say that you can now view the PS5 trophies on a PS4, and if you're the owner of a chat group, you can now delete it, and if you do, it will delete it for all of the members in that chat group. When you block someone, you can choose to leave the group that they and you are in, but if you're also in a group that includes other people with that person, then you will not be leaving that group as well. On Android and iOS... You can now use the PlayStation Remote Play app to access your PS4 via mobile data. There's some changes to the parental controls, so now that when a child requests to use a communication feature for a game, their parent or guardian will receive a notification on the PS4 and the PlayStation app, and the child will also receive a notification when the parent accepts, denies, or stops allowing the child to use a communication feature for a game. You can now select whether you'd like to receive notifications on your PS4 or through email about new products and special offers as well. What do you make of these patch notes? I mean, I guess the being able to see what that what that rich kid has been doing on his PS5 is, I guess, good. So you can go, ah, oh, good, good for you, mate. Good for you, dick. Yeah, you'll finally be able to see what I've been doing. <laughs> They're more quality of life. They're not really things that, like, are needed. Like, obviously, I don't need to be able to see what you've been doing on the PS5. I don't need to be able to delete a chat for everyone else, because then, obviously, I can just... If I... if I, Let's say I was a complete asshole to, uh, to people online, I can then just delete that chat, and that person no longer has evidence to report me. Well, I'm assuming that chat logs are still backlogged on Sony systems. And the question, I'd question on whether... When you blocked someone before, did it kick you out of chats that you were in or do we know if that was was a thing before or no it's just basically when you block someone before you would still remain in a chat with that person if it's just you and that person as well as obviously if you was in a group chat with that person as well whereas now when you block someone you can leave the single chat with just you and them but if you're in a group chat with them you'll stay in that group chat i don't think that's that useful because if it's a case of it's just you and them in a chat you're not go- they're not going to be talking to you you're not going to be talking to them anyway the only time that that would be beneficial is obviously in the actual group with other people where that the block person is still talking and other people are responding that obviously you don't know what the, the side of the conversation is with the block person so you'll just see like one side of the conversation and so you don't understand what, what's going on whereas at least whereas obviously if you leave you don't get to see either, either side so you don't have that mm, what are they talking about then I, I mean if you was that interested you could just unblock the person well, I think that giving that option is just so that when you block someone, you're able to remove that chat from the message lists in your friends list and everything, so that you're not seeing that and getting reminded of any conversations, and you don't have to see that person anymore. They're out of your mind. They're gone, kind of thing. Whereas for the group chat bit, I think that the blocked person still shows up in the messages, but just as PlayStation user, rather than their username or anything. So you can still see what's being said. Right. I don't know how useful on on the remote play app, which is not that it's not that stable anyway. You can now use your obviously mobile data, but how, do you think I'm made of money playing my PS4 via mobile data? Is going to cost a lot of money. Yeah, but if you don't have access to Wi-Fi, then you can play something if you can afford it. Yeah, it's just giving an extra option. That's all. It's like, yeah, it's it's useful if you're you know in in your limo being being driven around by your chauffeur around the town. Because obviously I have the money to be able to afford that. And I have, I'm have i out. I don't have access to my Wi-Fi. But generally, at home, generally you'll have Wi-Fi. Otherwise you wouldn't normally have a PlayStation account anyway. Yeah, but you could be out and about with no access to Wi-Fi and decide, I want to play a game, I'm bored. So do that. Yeah, but know that you can what, play like maybe a couple of minutes without accruing like a stupidly large bill. And then you know, the only... Positive thing I can see about this. I mean, the the pro- there's not something that really affects me because I don't have use of parental controls. If the, if the child's using communication features for for a game, I mean, for for one, the communication features on that game, I'm guessing it just means voice chat. No, well, there might be in-game messaging as well. Yeah, but yeah, there's so there's then obviously I'll get a notification. It's like, nah, I don't I don't want little little Timmy talking to people online it's like well why did i get him that game where these people i don't want him talking to are there 
parents could use it as a punishment if the child's been misbehaving, so you can't talk to your friends. But there's also the possibility of people who are much older going on that same game and being very inappropriate. So the parent could obviously block that person out. Yes. I don't know, the only thing, the thing I can think of is, like, it's like on 18 plus games, you get children who play them. But, they're, they're, oh, you, you can't use the communication and stuff, or you can't on the Vought headset. But that game in itself is obviously made for, it's, well, it's rated as to being designed for adults. Yeah, but to be fair, a child account can't play 18 plus games online anyway. I can if I have them use my account, or they make an account that is of age. Well, that's what I said. I said a child account can't do that. If they use an account that's over 18, then they can, obviously, do that. But a child account can't do that. Yeah, but then it, if if that was the case, it wouldn't send an apparent notification if it was if it was an adult's account, was it? Well, no, because they'll be using an adult's account. This only applies to a child's account, because obviously you don't need permission when you're an adult to do things, because you are an adult. The child will also receive a notification when their parent or guardian accepts, denies, or stops allowing the child to use communication. That's just going to make the um, spoiled child, spoiled children, just kick off at the fucking parents. You denied me. You denied me talking to that random stranger online. And then the parent can just say, "I can take away your console as well if that's a problem." You know, completely restrict your access if you're going to whine about it. Yeah. The new PS4 software update has apparently been causing some issues for some people. The update was originally rolled out as a beta in late July for the beta testers, but when the full rollout came recently, a number of players reported some issues that significantly impacted the performance of the PS4. Players began posting issues on Reddit with one user claiming that the patch significantly slowed down their PS4 and that they had to reboot the system several times before being able to open the PlayStation Store and that operating the system still remains a problem. Another user said that they've also faced issues with their PS4 being slowed down and that they needed to reboot the console before they could even launch a game. A few other users have also said that they've been receiving DNS server issues since installing the patch. These issues are occurring in the base slim and pro versions of the PS4, however it's not guaranteed because there's still plenty of people who say that they're yet to notice any issues after installing the patch. What do you make of that? It's been horrible, man. I don't know, I've just had the issue of... I've had con- controllers refusing to actually connect to the console, but then, weirdly enough, I didn't have this issue before the up- update per se, in that my controllers worked perfectly fine, and then obviously the day they brought this update out, I couldn't connect to the console anymore. But this was before I had actually installed the firmware update, and then it, it persisted after I'd updated. But had been, But prior to the update being available, it was working fine. For the past couple of days, I've just had to just turn the console on and off to actually get the controller to actually connect. Then sometimes when it does connect, it'll stay connected for a bit and then just suddenly decide, right, I'm go- I'm go- I'm go- I've disconnected. Now I can't-, I can't find anything to connect to. It's like, what what the hell? But that's the only issue I've personally had with my PS4 so far. Weirdly enough, I've not had that. I-, I didn't have that issue on the Pro, just the normal one. Okay, hopefully that issue doesn't persist permanently and you can actually have that fixed. I don't know whether Sony will be hot fixing any of these issues or rolling out a secondary patch or if they're just going to ignore it. They haven't said anything yet. Come on, they got to do something. Well, you know what companies are like. They always like evidence that things are actually being caused by them before they do anything, so... I don't know. I think it's pretty obvious that yeah, obviously they'll have to do something because they, dro- they drop an update and then suddenly they're getting loads of reports on, oh, this isn't working, so it's pretty damn obvious that it's to do with the update. Yeah, but they could also claim that it's not caused by the update because there's still a lot of users who don't have any issues whatsoever. If you don't have any issues, how do we know you don't have any issues? Because why would you report? Why would you be reporting that you don't have any issues? Because you've been reading people saying that they're having issues due to the update, so you, as someone who's updated the console, will say, well, I've updated it and I have no issues, like a bunch of people have. Yeah, but I, d- I doubt that you would you would submit an actual ticket to PlayStation, act- an actual report, and say, I have no issues. It's like, okay, well, you're misusing the report feature then. Well, obviously not. 
but so obvious, but obviously on so on PlayStation's end, they're just getting a, a bunch of stuff saying there's this problem. They won't be getting the stuff that's saying there isn't a problem. Well, we'll have to wait and see if they say anything about it. But the PS5 also got a system software update, and the patch notes for that one say that the control center is getting extra customization, and players can now customize the control center more freely by rearranging or choosing which controls to hide or unhide at the bottom of the screen. Enhanced game base so that players can now easily view and write messages to friends and parties directly from the game base in the control center. While viewing game base in full screen, players can also see how many friends are online, busy or offline, as well as accept, decline or cancel multiple friend requests at once. The game library has also had some changes, as well as the home screen. If you have a PS4 and a PS5 version of the same game installed, they'll now appear separately in the install tab of the game library and on the home screen. Each game's tile will now also clearly indicate which platform the game version belongs to. There's an update to the screen reader controls. Players can now pause or resume the screen reader by pressing the PlayStation button and the triangle button at the same time. They can also have the screen reader repeat things by pressing the PlayStation button and the R1 button at the same time. And for PlayStation Now, you can also select between 720p and 1080p to stream your games in. And there's also a streaming connection test to help identify and troubleshoot any problems with your connection. There's also a new accolade type, which is called Leader. There's also a new automatic capture of personal best videos, which will be automatically recording a video when you complete challenges for a better time or a higher score and set your personal best and that will be saved and you can share those clips directly from the challenge card or in the control center or from the media gallery and you can also turn this off in the capture and broadcast settings. There's now a new trophy tracker, so you can now track five trophies per game through the control center. There is now 3D audio support for built-in TV speakers. The biggest part of this patch is the M.2 SSD storage expansion. It's now been given the green light. After months of beta testing, they now have a safe list of requirements for specific M.2 SSDs that you can fit in your PS5 system. Obviously, you need to check the requirements to make sure that the one you're going to get is compatible with your system. And I'll leave a link in the description for the list for anyone who's interested. And Android and iOS users can now also remotely stream games from their PS5 using a data connection. What do you make of the PS5 patch notes? I mean, they're more, a lot more expansive than the PS4 patch notes. Yes. But obviously, like for some things, I'm like, I have no idea what the hell it's talking about. Because, I mean, I don't use control center customizations. Like, I don't know what that one on earth this control center is. Well, basically, when you press the PlayStation button on the PS5 controller, it brings up like a little menu at the bottom of the screen. And that's the control center. Before, how did how did you have games show up? for? If you had a PS4 and a PS5 version, same game, how did they show up? It was a single tile. So it was just the game application. And then you would go over to it, you'd press options. And then at the bottom of the list, it would say game version. And you'd click that to switch between PS4 or PS5. And if you had the PS4 version selected and tried to launch it, it would pop up with a message that says, you're about to launch the PS4 version. Do you want to switch to the PS5? Or are you fine with uh, launching the PS4 version? And that was that. I don't know. Personally, I think I I think I prefer that. It's less It's less clutter. That's what I thought as well, personally. I think it makes it cleaner if it's just the one tile for the for the game rather than two. But I suppose they want to make it even more obvious which one you're clicking on or launching. And then, obviously, what on earth are the accolades for? The accolades, I'm not completely sure still, because I've not seen a use for them. They're basically multiplayer-specific things that you can rate other players with different accolades, and those accolades then go on to that person's PSN profile, so you can basically judge what kind of person they are based on the way they've been in multiplayer games, I guess. But I've not seen an option to even use them before, so I don't know. Yeah. Well, to be fair, do you play multiplayer games? I've done a little bit of multiplayer, but not much. And I know that so far I have zero accolades, so... I'll send you one later. Well, you need a PS5 for that. I'll buy a PS5 and then send you one later. Uh, they ain't st- I, ch- I checked yesterday. They're in stock nowhere. But yeah, so the the, the, ac- the lack of accolades look a lot like... I think there's like an accolade system on Overwatch. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. But it goes on, it goes onto your public profile. Yeah. But then there is also... There isn't one for like... It doesn't appear to be one for like negative stuff. The whole point in the accolade system was to promote a positive community so they're only going to be positive things well how do i know if someone's a shitbag then then you report them 
But how do I know, as the other person, that this player is going is is a shitbag by looking at their profile without having to play with them? Well, they won't have ma- many good accolades, will they? They might just be new. Well, you can easily check when an account was made. So automatic capture of personal best. I don't. How does it? How does it know what I want recorded? And then if I don't want it recorded, now I've got now it's got that taken up space on my hard drive. Well, you know, similar to on the PS4, when you play through something and then something happens and you think, oh. That would be good if it was recorded, and then you can actually go on your share button and capture the bit that's just happened. Yeah. It basically does that. If you set your personal best on a record, it will go, well, since you've done that, I'll capture what you just did, and then it saves it to your media gallery. You can obviously turn that setting off, like I said, but I've turned it off on mine because I don't really need it to do that. If I want to save something, I'll save it myself. Yeah. yeah the, tro- the trophy tracker's good, I think. Yeah. As long as it's not, like, intrusive on... Like, it's a thing that you can you can pop up and pop down. It is. It's it's on the cards in the control centre, so when you press the PlayStation button, the control centre pops up, and at the top of the control centre, you've got cards. And if you're tracking trophies, it'll be the first few cards that are on there, so you can check, see what you've got left to do, pop it back down again, carry on with the game. Yeah. But also in the news, we have the Little Big Planet servers being shut down permanently. After a few, a few months of the PS4 servers for Little Big Planet 3 being down, they're now back online. And with the community restored and working as before, however, the servers for all of the prior PS3 and PS Vita versions will remain offline indefinitely, having been shut down in an effort to protect the Little Big Planet community and keep online services safe. As back in May, Sony shut down the servers for the first three games due to ongoing attacks and malicious messages left by hackers. The issue went back to late last year when Eurogamer reported that ongoing DDoS attacks and unstable servers could be traced back to a single fan who was unhappy with Sony's treatment of the franchise. There were also reports from players of being unable to play some community-made content and offensive messages appearing in the game. We have no doubt that this news will come as a disappointment to a lot of you. Ultimately, this is the best way to protect the Little Big Planet community and to help ensure that our online environment remains safe. And that was from Sony in a statement on Twitter. What do you make of this? So I can't, I can't play those anymore. You can, you can play Little Big Planet 3 again online. And you can still play Little Big Planet 1 and 2 in single player, just not online. You play Little Big Planet in single player, you play it with your homies. I mean, I played Sackboy all the way through on my own. So is is Sackboy's adventure any different to Little Planet? Because Little, Little Planet, the whole thing was the community was the appeal of the game. Yeah, it had like a little bit of a story, but the primary objective is just creating a community where you all you create stuff together. It's similar. It's basically a Little Big Planet game, but the and you have that community element still baked into the story, as you're referred to as a knitted knight. And there's a lot of knitted knights out there. And there are obviously co-op missions that are only accessible with another person. So I've not played those ones. But most of the trophies for the game are multiplayer trophies. So it's still encouraging you to play it with other people. And obviously that, that brings another point. How do I get the co-op trophies on? Like on like, Little Planet 1, 2 and 3, how do I do the co-op stuff? Some levels are obviously co-op. Some parts of levels, like in the, sto- in the story, it has sections that you can only get these collectibles if you have a second person with you. I would assume you can still do local co-op. Ugh, I've got to have some ran- I've got to have someone come to my house and touch my things. Yeah, you just can't connect to the online servers anymore because those are down. But if you're looking to pick up a new PlayStation game this week, then on the 14th we had Deathloop on the PS5, Kiwi on the PS5, and then on the 15th we had Collateral Damage Remastered on PS4 and PS5, Dustwind The Last Resort on the PS5 and PS4, Flynn Son of Crimson on the PS4, Gunducky Industries on the PS4, Marik's Market on the PS4, The Explorer of Night on the PS4, Titan Chaser on the PS4. On the 16th we had Poker Pretty Girls Battle, Texas Hold'em on the PS4 and PS5, Project Winter Blackout on the PS4, and on the 17th we have Origami 2 on the PS4 and PS5, Tales of Iron on the PS5, The Amazing American Circus on the PS4, Totem on the PS4 and PS5, and Virtual Surfing on the PS4. Do any of those games take your interest? Well, to be perfectly fair, I've not heard of like, a good chunk of this stuff. The only one I've heard of is obviously Devloop, and I can't play that. Actually, no, I, I could play that. I could get, I could get it for, I could get it for Win. It's also on Windows, apparently. It is on PC, yes. Poker pr- Pretty Girls Battle. By any chance, does that include, does that have scantily clad women in it? I find it hard to believe that that would be very respectful of women. <laughs> 
where are based on the screenshots to typical anime girls. I think I've I've, I've heard of collateral damage before, I'm sure. Cat lateral damage. It's basically a, a cat sim where you destroy things. Yeah, but now it's remastered. Yes. Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I wreck things as a cat sometime, if I ever get through my, my entire backlog. Well, my backlog's about to get bigger at the end of the year. Yeah. But also, coming out on the Game Pass this month, we had Flynn, Son of Crimson on the 15th, I'm Fish on the 16th, Skatebird, Superliminal, and then on the 17th we had Aragami 2. On the 23rd we'll have Lost Worlds, Beyond the Page, Sable, Subnautica, Below Zero, Tainted Grail, Conquest. On the 28th we've got Lemnis Gate. On the 30th we've got Astraya Ascending, Unsighted, and then on October 1st we have Phoenix Point. Do any of those games take your interest? None of these I really know what they are. I mean, I, guess, I would guess, obviously, I Am Fish is, is maybe a fish simulator. Skatebird, maybe, I don't know, about, is it like Tony Hawk, but birds? Possibly. Also in the news, we have the Xbox app being updated so that PCs can stream games via the cloud or console. As of September 14th, X- Xbox app can support both playing Xbox Game Pass games from the cloud and playing games directly from your console with Xbox Remote Play. What do you think about that? It's good. I don't. I mean, I don't know of a situation that I would be using my PC to play games that I have on my Xbox. I think maybe the other way around. Maybe I guess that that would work if obviously you had P- a PC that doesn't have the specs for certain games. Well, if you're looking for a free game this week, then you can head over to the Epic Game Store and claim Speed Brawl and Tharsis, which will be available from now until the 23rd of September. Speed Brawl is that kind of like a cell shaded like kind of borderlands looking like smash bros yes so if you have some homies coming around you could maybe play that or at least obviously pick it up for free now and then when you have your friends over how about tharsis is that something you'd be interested in see i used to be interested in strategy games i mean normal my thing was more like real-time strategy than turn-based but obviously i mean chess is obviously a turn-based strategy game which i used to obviously play but yeah, turn-based strategy game, tabletop mechanics that are Mars. So it's kind of like, it's be kind of like Warhammer 40k, but set in, like, actually on a real planet, rather than, like, some fictional sci-fi universe. Well, from what I saw, it's not set on a planet whatsoever, it's set in a spaceship. Okay. And you're making decisions based on the survival and preservation of your crew, but some decisions can also lead to their deaths. Yes, yes. So, it's kind of managing resources and going with moral choices as well as trying to make sure people survive that need to survive. Oh, so like, six, something like 60 parsecs game? Yeah. So it's like that. Kind of like that, yeah. But I think it's a bit more involved and complex than that one. Yeah. Also in the news, Epic Games head Tim Sweeney has responded to the ruling in the Apple lawsuit. Epic Games and Apple have of course been in a court battle for quite a while and it's finally finished as the judge ruled an injunction on September the 10th that's scheduled to take effect in 90 days on December the 9th. It specifies that Apple is hereby permanently restrained and enjoined from prohibiting developers from including in their apps and their metadata buttons external links or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms in addition to in-app purchasing through account registration with the app. The court has also ruled that app and game developers can now use third-party payment methods for apps and games hosted on the App Store, thus allowing them to work around Apple's 30% transaction fee. The lawsuit, of course, started due to Epic updating the Fortnite mobile app with a direct purchase option that would circumvent Apple's restrictions, and then Apple decided to remove the game from the iOS Store, so Epic Games decided to sue Apple. And after this win, Tim Sweeney has confirmed that Fortnite will return to the iOS Apple Store when and where Epic can offer in-app payment in fair competition with Apple in-app payment passing along the savings to customers. He also stressed that that ruling isn't a win for developers or for consumers. Epic is fighting for fair competition among in-app payment methods and app stores for a billion consumers. What do you make of that? Apple should have won. Why? You're using Apple's platform. You kind of have to pay the guy whose platform it is to use their platform. You're paying them to have your game on there. 
Yeah. But this whole thing was about other purchases within your app. So if you put paid Apple to have your app on there, and then you put microtransactions in your app, 30% of the profit from those microtransactions would have gone in Apple's pocket. That's what it was all about. Epic Games obviously didn't want to give 30% of their microtransaction profit to Apple. I think that nobody wants to have to pay the guy who owns the platform a cut. Yeah, well, the judge obviously thought that it was unfair that they was charging 30% of that kind of stuff. So all they get now is the holding fee to have the app on the store. Apple got shafted. I also think that Tim Sweeney's comment about make it being a win for the consumers rather than developers or anyone else is not honest because I simply see it as him wanting to keep the 30% rather than paying Apple, not being for the consumers. But yeah, it's, it's not beneficial to consumers. It's beneficial to Epic. They get to circumvent whatever the hell contract they signed when they put when putting the thing on the store, which is a bit underhanded. Paying Apple to be able to make money off their platform is kind of what you agree to when you put your app on their store. Yeah, but they thought it was unfair, which is why they added their own direct payment in the Fortnite mobile app, which then obviously Apple was like, well, that's not allowed, I'm taking that down. I don't like that. Yeah. Because obviously Apple wants the 30% rather than allowing for the direct payments. Also in the news, we have Nesting Games, which was originally formed sometime last month by some ex-Ubisoft developers. It's a Canadian-based studio, and they've recently announced their co-ownership by the Italian publisher Digital Bros. The CCO of Nesting Games was quoted as saying, We want to go back to creating RPGs that are focused on immersion, great characters, powerful storytelling, and strong gameplay. We are moving away from the massive open-world model full of icons to clean up, and returning to experiences that are content-driven and ultimately respect the player's time. Whether you play our game for 30 minutes or a two-hour session, what you'll get is always interesting content and a gratifying experience. And according to the Nesting Game website, the CCO previously contributed to Assassin's Creed Syndicate and Assassin's Creed Odyssey, and he was the lead game designer on both projects while working for Ubisoft. Nesting Games is also comprised of ex-Ubisoft employees like director Sebastian Brassard, who worked on Prince of Persia and Slender cell series and the narrative director james matag who is a script writer for assassin's creed valhalla and immortals phoenix rising we are blessed to have digital bros as co-owners of the studio as it allows us to fast track our studio life cycle and that was from brassard we felt from day one that we were part of the family of digital bros and On top of this, our open and collaborative recruitment has helped us build a full roster of incredible talent to build our game. This process will help us deliver the strong values upon which our studios are founded. What do you think about this? 30 minutes to to a two-hour session, then be rookie numbers. Who plays games for like 30 minutes to two hours? People who have very busy lives. I know, I could never do it. After a long day, I'm going to sit down, play a game, and play and play that for hours. But yeah, the um, a question that them saying they want to go back to obviously doing, creating RPGs that are focused on immersion, great characters, powerful storytelling, and strong gameplay. I'm going to question back to, when did you, when did you ever make an RPG that is focused on immersion, great characters, storytelling, and gameplay? Oh, they might have done that towards the start of their career, I don't know. They might have been involved in some projects back then. I do agree with the moving away from massive open world model filled with icons clean up. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm interested to see what game they'll be making anyway, but it'll be interesting to see what comes out of that studio. Yeah. In Nintendo news, we have a Bluetooth audio update. Only one Bluetooth audio device can be paired at a time, but up to 10 devices can be saved on a Nintendo Switch system. Bluetooth microphones cannot be used, and you may experience audio latency depending on your Bluetooth device. What do you think about this? That's good. You don't have to plug in your earbuds anymore. It doesn't really affect me because, like, yes, I have I have got Bluetooth earbuds somewhere, but I feel this would only be, I guess, useful if you had the, like, the normal normal switch and played on the TV because then you could sit on the other side of the room and obviously still have, like, it in your head. Yeah. But for peop- people like me who just have the light, who are literally just going to be holding the console anyway, I could just plug in a wired connection and there won't be any latency issues. <laughs> Yeah, but, you know, not everyone likes to have a wire. But yeah, so it's good, it's good that obviously they have that. But also with the Switch, the price is getting dropped. The standard Nintendo Switch has been at 279 for its entire 
Life and has now been found in stores online for two hundred and fifty nine ninety nine in the UK. What do you make of that? I mean, that's a given. They're bringing out a new, slightly upgraded Switch, so yeah, obviously older models are going to be reduced in price because they're not as in demand. Because realistically, if you didn't have a Switch and you had to pick one of the two, despite the fact that obviously the OLED isn't that much of a difference, it would be the option that would make the most sense to get. Because obviously they were around the same price, so you might as well have just got obviously the OLED. Yeah. Well, when I saw the OLED announced initially, I didn't know if they were going to be dropping the price of the Switch because obviously there was roughly about a £30 difference in price. But the Switch OLED obviously just has a better screen and that's it. So dropping the price didn't really seem to be like it was inevitable because it's obviously a minor difference. But now they've put it obviously a much bigger price gap between the two. So if you was waiting for a Switch, then now's your chance to get the original a lot cheaper. Well... £20 cheaper. But also in the news we have Deathloop is apparently having some issues on the PC. The critical response to Deathloop is almost unanimously glowing as it has an 88% score on Metacritic and yet the overall user rating on Steam is mixed with 64% of the more than 2,400 user reviews coming in as positive. The majority of the negative reviews on Steam complain about stuttering during gameplay. What's actually producing the stuttering isn't clear but obviously a lot of people have made up their theories, but a statement was made by the Bethesda community manager, Andre Carlos, and he said, Regarding performance, we are aware of reports that some PC users are experiencing stuttering issues in Deathloop. We are actively investigating the issue right now as a priority, and we will update you with more specific information as soon as possible. And he wrote that as a comment on Reddit. What what do you think about this? Obviously, stuttering issues isn't that much of an issue. Like, com- compared to, like, when Cyberpunk came out, that was just filled with problems, and obviously Bethesda's known for having very buggy games. Stuttering issues is pretty mild. Well, whatever's causing the stuttering issues, I'm assuming that they'll be able to clear that up within a few weeks after, obviously, a bit of QA testing and stuff. Also in the news, we have some games getting delayed, starting off with Total War Warhammer 3 being delayed into 2022. The chief product officer, Rob Bartholomew, said... While it's tempting to rush to the finish line as it comes into view, we have made the decision to give it a little more time by moving the launch of Total War Warhammer 3 from 2021 to early 2022. The wait won't be much longer and we'll have plenty of new information for you in the meantime. The new date will make it for a stronger release and the best first step into a new era for Total War Warhammer. We don't consider this release the end of our trilogy but the start of years of content and support as we continue to bring the jaw-dropping scale of Games Workshop Fantasy Universe to Total War. What did you think of this? I don't know. That's, that's fine. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a turn-based strategy game. Think Civilization, but set in the Warhammer Universe. Yeah, I kind of thought it would be a strategy game, but I've not really been involved with the Warhammer Universe since its beginning. So The next game that was re- delayed was Battlefield 2042, which was originally set to release on October 22nd. It's now been delayed, and Electronic Arts announced that because of unforeseen challenges created by the COVID-19 pandemic, it has elected to push back the game until November 19th. What do you think of that? I don't know, I mean, yes, obviously the the pandemic would have pushed them back a bit, but how how much is it affecting them now? Because I don't think, a good chunk of the world is not really dealing with that pandemic that much. It's not as bad as obviously it was last year. Maybe they've had staff off ill with COVID more recently. Maybe they had a lot of staff off, they had a COVID outbreak at the office, I don't know. Well, all they say was it was unforeseen challenges, so I don't know. But it's only just under a month, so it's not too far. Yeah. Another game that was delayed was Dying Light 2. It's now been delayed into 2022. Previously scheduled to launch on December 7th, 2021, the CEO of Techland has said the team is steadily progressing with the production and the game is nearing the finish line. The game is complete and we are currently playtesting it. It is by far the biggest and most ambitious project we've ever done. Unfortunately, we've realised for us to bring the game to the level that we envisioned, we need more time to polish and optimise it. What do you think of that? It's not the first time, obviously, it's been delayed. No. 
just constant delay. Yeah, but now they're saying that the game is done. They're just playtesting it to make sure they can polish and optimise it before release. Better than that, then, it comes out, a buggy mess, gets shit on, then they have to take it off the store. You know, the situation they had with Cyberpunk, which is never going to recover from its release. It is and always will be the game that people refer to as, oh, that obviously, this is the worst case scenario. Yeah, it definitely set the benchmark for a poor release. But I prefer this kind of statement for a delayed game than the previous one with EA, because, you know, this is a bit more open. You know exactly what they're actually doing and why they've decided to delay it. Unforeseen challenges isn't really useful information. But also in the news, we have Razer, who have decided to announce finger sleeves. According to their website, these sleeves are made out of a smooth, high-sensitivity fabric, which is made of 35% silver fibre fabric, 60% nylon and 5% spandex. And they are lightweight and breathable and come in just one size. And they are made for mobile gamers. I presume to prevent finger smudging on your screen. What did you think of it? I mean, they look like they look like like cloth thimbles. But yeah, they look. It's a similar similar thing to. I have some gloves that are designed to be able to. You can still use your phone with the glove on, but it's, that's only on one finger. I have to use that one finger on my phone to touch things, and obviously, so that I, one I can wear gloves so my hands don't freeze to death, and two, obviously, I can still use the phone. And it doesn't smudge, but. Let's be real, the these finger sleeves, if you buy them, you're probably gonna lose them. They're small, they fit on your fingers, you're gonna lose you're gonna lose one at like probably pretty quickly. Yeah. Well also in the news we have a server shutdown for Warhammer forty thousand Eternal Crusade. It had a server shutdown on September the tenth. With both PvP and PvE modes completely inaccessible, the game client is no longer available for download on Steam. Eternal Crusade was released in 2016 and received mixed reviews at the time. As part of the shutdown, all personal data related to Warhammer 40k Eternal Crusade has been removed. We are proud of all the work that went into Warhammer 40k Eternal Crusade and for the amazing community that rallied behind the game. Thank you for everything. We appreciate all of your support throughout the years. Thank you for this adventure. That was a community post from the developers of the game. What did you think of this? I got this game free with my motherboard, but I never got chance. I never actually played through it, and now I can't. Yep, yeah, it's gone now. Stop taking my games off me. Just let me have. Just let me keep keep this game that I own. And maybe they'll do like obviously you get with some some games get like fans set up servers to keep the games running. Yeah, but also in the news we have Valheim ahead of the Hearth and Home. DLC launch on September 18th, the creator Richard Svensson and generalist artist Robin Iyer have discussed what fans can expect from the update in a video titled Fireside Chat. Svensson clarified in the video that the best way to play Hearth and Home will be through playing on a completely new world. He's quoted as saying, I really hope people will, instead of just continue playing with their own worlds, actually create a new world and start from the beginning. We added some new locations to the planes biome and if you've already explored parts of the plains biome those areas will not be changed you will have to go to unexplored areas to find new things what did you think of this i'm I'm one of those guys who i don't want to have to keep restarting my game every time there's like new stuff comes out yeah but obviously yeah that does come with the fact that some of this new stuff won't show up obviously in your game if you've explored the whole world but i mean personally this doesn't affect me because i have i don't even own valheim i have not played it so this does not affect me but and obviously if i ever were to play it this i I would have the new stuff but then obviously they're going to release another thing after that and then I'm going to need to make a new completely separate game for that. And you're constantly start restarting. So you made all that you made made this progress. He's like, I got all these great shit. And then, oh, the new update out. Now I can't access the stuff for the new update unless I go make a new world. Yeah, I don't agree with having to start a new world just to be able to see the new things. I think they should have done one of two things. Either make a separate option in the menu to open that version of the world and you can carry your save over and continue with all the stuff you've got but now you can see the new stuff or update the world so that all the new things are there and however it was before is just not there anymore kind of like how they did with world of warcraft when they updated a new expansion things just change yeah but the, the question is the capability of being able to do that why can't they just have obviously stuff 
to sh- show up in the new d- new game. Obviously, you'll, you'll s- all the, like, the new items and stuff should still be available, obviously, on your old saves. But like they said, I think they said, they said that there's new new well, there's new like, biomes or something or new new locations in the plains biome. Yeah, I understand that you've already got that world is that place in the world is already registered to your computer. So obviously, it, it can't just change that because you've already got that. I don't know. It's like a lot of games bring out like new maps for games, and I generally don't play on like the new new maps if I already got a game. Because why should I start all over again? <laughs> I don't wanna. Yeah. So you get you get maybe like maybe ninety percent of the update on your old save, but you're just missing that ten percent unless you want to start fresh. It depends on how how far you are in the game. If I have spent like a thousand hours in that world, I'm not gonna be like you know what I want to start all over again. Yeah. I don't want to start with. I don't want us to help nothing again. <laughs> That's why I suggested, obviously, having the new DLC or whatever as a second option on the main menu, but being able to carry your save over, kind of like what they did with The Witcher Three when they had a completely new location, but you could still have all your stuff and everything carried over. Also, in the news, we have Splitgate. As the developer 1047 Games has raised $100 million from a bunch of venture capital investors, the focus on the coming months will be to growing to become the next big AAA studio while staying true to our roots as an indie team that prioritises our community. When Splitgate comes out of beta and launches, it will be a truly historic launch. And that's what the studio wrote in a statement. What do you think of that? I mean, yeah, obviously everyone wants to be the next big thing, but you don't set out with the goal of we want to be the next, we want to be the next AAA title, but then, like, why? Because they want to be successful. We want to be the next AAA title, but then also obviously keep their vision of being an in- indie team, and you can't really have your cake and eat it. You're either going to get big, and then you've got to be able to keep up this workflow, and that is then going to drag on people. People are going to leave, people are going to, new people are going to come. You cannot be both rich and have a good community among yourselves. It's going to become about the money. That's what always happens when you become a tri- tri- AAA games developer. It's all it's all about how this game can make you money, and less so how this game feels to play. Or is this good? Is is this a good game? Is this my vision? Also, in the news, we have. GameStop, as they have decided they want to move beyond games and evolve into a tech company. GameStop has two long-term goals, delighting customers and delivering value for stockholders. We are evolving from a video game retailer to a technology company that connects customers with games, entertainment and a wide assortment of products. We are focused on offering a vast product selection, competitive pricing and fast shipping, supported by high-touch customer service and a frictionless e-commerce and in-store experience. That is a quote from a rep for the company. What did you think about that? If it's just with just technology, technology and stuff, yeah, fine. I mean, can you really call yourself GameStop if you not, you don't specialize in like games? Well, they're still going to be selling games. It's just obviously not their main focus anymore. They're going to be selling tech stuff as well. Yeah. But also in the news, we have Alan Wake remastered. It's been confirmed that all of the product placement that was in the original is going to be removed for the remastered version. A PR rep for Alan Wake remastered confirmed that, so there'll be no Verizon, Energizer, Ford or Lincoln branded stuff in the game. The reason is that the deals for those brands have been expired for a long time, so obviously they can't actually do that anyway. I mean, yeah, that's a given, but then obviously like, some of the stuff, you kind of have to have some kind of advertisement, like... They've got like a billboard with Verizon on it. Obviously, that just can't just be a white, just a blank white billboard. There's got to be something on it. Someone's got to sponsor it. Well, they'll just change the picture on it. That's it. It doesn't have to be a brand. It can just be anything. In other news, we have a new Brothers in Arms game confirmed to be in development. Gearbox CEO has confirmed that and said, I think the next Brothers in Arms game has to be authentic. And we have been working on that. What do you think about that? I don't know, I've played the Brothers and Arms game, but obviously, I mean, they do a decent job with the Borderlands series. Yeah, I've never played Brothers and Arms. Maybe we could be Brothers and Arms, play it together. Is it a co-op game? I don't have a clue, I, I just wanted to make the joke. Well, tough. Also in the news, we have Darkest Dungeon 2 has a release date for the early access to the game, and it's going to be coming to Epic Game Store on October 26th, 2021. How old is the original Darkest Dungeon? I don't know. I don't think it was that old. 
Well, they've got a sequel coming into Early Access. Also in the news, we have NVIDIA, as they've confirmed, a leaked GeForce list as real, but claims that the games on the list were speculative. They're quoted as saying, NVIDIA is aware of an unauthorised published game list with both released and or speculative titles used only for internal tracking and testing. Inclusion on the list is neither confirmation nor an announcement of any game. NVIDIA took immediate action to remove access to the list. No confidential game builds or personal information were exposed. What do you think about that? I know, it's an indication, obviously. Okay, so they will probably support these games? I mean... That's not guaranteed, as they said that they were using them for internal tracking and testing. I'm obviously not going to mention what the games were, because we don't know which ones are actually real and which ones aren't. I mean, to be fair, what 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 games does like GeForce not work with? Is there any games that come that come out where they're just like, nah, we're not we're not supporting that? I don't know. Nvidia, GeForce will continue to make games as look as pretty as possible. Yeah. In game trailer news, though, we have a new trailer for a game called Tuesday Morning. What did you make of it? Yeah, it looks looks alright. Looks very re- very reminiscent of like Final Fantasy Fifteen. Yeah. Obviously, I, th- I think it has more. I don't know if it ha- if it's necessarily set in a similar kind of world. I, th- I think I saw. Like, I th- I'm sure I saw like a minotaur or something, which isn't very obviously Final Fantasy. They didn't really give much information away, did they? But it was just an announcement trailer, so hopefully we'll have more information on it soon. All it said at the end for release date wise was 2021, so no specific month or date. So possibly we'll be getting a gameplay trailer in a few weeks' time. Yeah. But that just about does it this week. If you have any thoughts on anything we've discussed this week, leave them in the comment section below as always. And we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.